Hey guys, this show is presented by Metrics Agency. Metrics Agency provides products and services that help businesses simplify data to make better decisions. Own your data. Don't let it own you. Metrics Agency is trusted by the best and most successful brands in the world, and they'll help you transform your business. Get in touch with Metrics Agency today, www.metricsagency.com or info at metricsagency.com. All right. Should we uh, get into this? Yeah, let's go. Welcome to episode six of Mayhem to Measurement, presented by Metrics Agency. I'm Chris Book, joined by Chris Eatsima. Hello. If you're new to the show, welcome. Appreciate you checking us out. Questions or comments, you can always get in touch with us at info at metricsagency.com or on Twitter. I'm at Chris Book. He's at Sietsema, S-I-E-T-S-E-M-A, or you can find both of us on LinkedIn. If you haven't already, we'd like to encourage you to head over to metricsagency.com, sign up for our emails. Great way to stay in touch with the show and stay on top of your analytics game. In the past couple weeks since we launched those, so many have been nice with kind words and shares and retweets, all of that. Please keep doing that. And if you do like the show, make sure you subscribe and drop us a five-star rating wherever you pick up your podcasts. Today, we're going to deviate from the more curriculum-focused items that we've been covering in recent weeks here. And we're going to try to make this a little bit more tangible for you. And we're going to provide you with what we think are some really great examples of data-driven action at work. Now, I think we'll do this periodically uh, in subsequent episodes and down the road, maybe once a quarter, once every few weeks, we'll do something like this. But as we continue to revisit this, I think it's a really good source of not only teaching, but also some pretty good inspiration. And if nothing else, might be a little bit interesting. So our first vignette, I think we'll call it that, a case study vignette, whatever. First one today deals with Will Smith. And Chris, I know this is one that you've... Uh, talked about for a long time. You've always found it pretty interesting, and so do I. So let's get into that. This is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. <laughs> so right, I think it was right around 96, if I recall, the, the amazing show, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. A show of note. Yeah, and, and for our listening audience, you can't see me, obviously, but right now I'm doing the Carlton. Uh, it ended, and Will Smith had come to a point in his career where he'd been on a sitcom. He'd been a rapper, uh, among other things. And he needed to kind of redefine where he was going. So he sat down with his business agent or his business manager, rather, and his agent. And essentially said, listen, I want to be the biggest movie star in the world. And so what they proceeded to do was they looked at the top grossing movies of all time just by box office successes, right? So how how much money was made by these movies in the movie theater. And they came away with some common threads amongst the movies that did particularly well. Those, those elements were essentially, those movies had special effects. They typically had creatures or monsters. And then sometimes there was a love story involved. And when you think about it, before 1996, the biggest movies of all times in terms of box office box office success were things like jaws and the terminator and star wars and jurassic park right so special effects creatures and potentially a love story mixed in and so what he did is he started started to only take movies that had those three elements at least two of the three elements in there so he did movies like independence day and men in black and I Am Legend, which is actually a really good one. And of course, he had some clunkers in there too, like Wild Wild West and Hancock. If you've ever seen that one, I'm, I'm sorry. And I Robot and some others that just weren't that great. But all in all, I think he did a pretty good job in terms of becoming one of the one of the biggest, probably not the biggest, but one of the biggest movie stars um, in the world. And since that time, those three elements are actually kind of found pretty commonly in in, in movies that do quite well in terms of box office success since 1996, like outside the ones that Will Smith was in, things like Avatar, Titanic, which had a ton of special effects and obviously a love story, all the Avengers movies, even more Star Wars movies, they did really, really well. And so the takeaway with this one is that we can look at our our history and find commonalities and common threads and categorical likenesses between things to really help us impact 
what we should do in the future and impact our success in the future. So taking a look at the the numbers and the metrics behind us to help us predict what we should do moving forward. For the record, I loved Hancock. (laughs) I did. I I like it more than anything else on that list. Mm. Now, I've also never seen a Star Wars movie, so don't really don't tell anybody I said that. Um, I do think it, it just the simplistic approach to that though is really insightful. And I think it speaks to so much of what we talk about where, you know, we, we want to look at things from so many different things and we want to start mapping correlations and you know, we want to start running regressions and sometimes just figure out what's rising to the top and go that direction. You know, it's, it's still measurement, but it doesn't have to be so complex. So the next little vignette we have here is one of my absolute favorites. And when, whenever I'm talking to somebody about analytics or how to use data, this is one of my staple examples that usually really helps the lights go on for people. So it's a 1974 study by a guy named uh, Paul Slovak. He was, and I don't, I don't even know if he's still alive, but at least at the time, world-class economist. I know he worked with some Nobel laureates, really, really smart guy and, and somebody that people to this day really quote quite a bit. And I actually heard this story, I think it was I think I heard like by way of Tim Ferriss and he was interviewing some, someone, I think it was Adam Rosenstein or Robinson maybe is the guy's name, but nonetheless, great story. That's really impactful. So what this guy, Paul Slovic did is he went to a racetrack and he was going to study the value of information and how much that impacts the quality of decision-making. So what he did is he asked, you know, the, the kind of the, the professional or the world class, the really successful gamblers at the racetrack to predict the winner of horse races over five rounds. And the way this experiment would work is with each round, the gambler would have a certain number of pieces of information they requested, but only certain numbers. So in the first round, you wouldn't get any information. And then the next round, you'd get five pieces, then 10 pieces, then 20 pieces, and then 40 pieces. And so this was whatever the gambler wanted. So Horses' weight, past performance, lineage, all this stuff that that these uh, horse handicappers use frequently. And what you would do then with this is, one, predict the outcome of the races. And two, he also wanted to see the impact that it had on the gambler's respective confidence level. And so the first round was pretty straightforward. Uh, you got 17% um, for for the success rate, which is, frankly, better than the 10% chance that that you just had right out of the gate if you weren't doing anything. But what was more fascinating with that is that you had a 19% confidence level. So basically these gamblers, when they had their five pieces of information, they, they were pretty good. They, uh, they outperformed what the statistical probability would have been and their confidence level was right in line with that. So there you go. Round zero rounds, one, pretty much the same performance. From round two forward, so when you had the 10 pieces and the 20 pieces and the 40 pieces of information, what's really fascinating here is that the success rate never rose above 17%, but the confidence rate ultimately actually doubled and got as high as 34%. So the more data that these gamblers had at their disposal, remember, these aren't recreational guys. These were professional guys that made their living at the racetrack, but the more data that they had at their disposal it essentially had no impact on their ability to make a quality decision. And I, th- I think that's a, that's a very, very clear depiction of what we talk about on the show with finding the right data and focusing on that rather than trying to focus on all the data. Because beyond a certain amount of data, we do not make better decisions. And that, again, is why it's so important to find what matters and focus on that. I think this really does a good job of showing the risk that organizations have as we become more sophisticated with technology and we start collecting more data. I've worked with organizations where we had entire wings of buildings dedicated to collecting data. And that's that's all well and good. But if that's not going to be useful or if that's going to distract you from making core decisions, then it's not worth it at all. So I always found that to be a very interesting story about data simplicity and the actual art of decision making with data. I love it. I feel like going to the track right now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right, next story is um, one that I, I found really interesting, primarily because I really love horticulture and, and botany and things like that. Um, people that know me know that uh, I live in a neighborhood that's actually an old orange grove in Arizona. And so 
Uh, around my house, there's literally 15 orange trees. It's a lot of work, but it's a good time. Um, and it's always a good place to come get a, uh, uh, a mimosa or a screwdriver or something like that as well. So I can vouch for that. You have the best oranges I've ever had. It's all about the fertilizer. Um, one, one unrelated question. I guess we'll call it a statistical question. How many oranges did you, does each of those trees put off in a growing season? Oh my God. I don't know. 300. It's a lot. I give a lot away. Cause when I was over there the other day, it looked to me like there were at least 200 oranges on each tree. Uh, probably. Yeah. It's probably around. Yeah. Probably a lot. It feels like 300 when you're picking them, but it's probably more like that, that estimate 200 or so. It's an impressive haul. Yeah. Thanks. It's a lot of work. So there's a company in Brazil that does pulp production called Fibria. It's a Brazilian pulp production facility. Actually, they have four facilities in total. And they, they grow eucalyptus trees on planted forests. And what that means is a planted forest isn't something they're just naturally harvesting from a random forest. They're growing these trees for the purpose of harvesting them. And they're, they have, eucalyptus is actually really important because and a really smart choice because it's pretty versatile. Like with eucalyptus, you, you can make paper and construction timber and plywood and poles and packing. They do a lot of tissue. So like, for example, a lot of like uh, paper towels and things like that actually are eucalyptus um, originated or original eu- eucalyptus trees. And they've got a pretty fast growth cycle. So depending upon what you're actually um, harvesting them for in the production, uh, they could be anywhere from four to five years even or up to eight to 10 years, depending upon what you need. And they've got a very narrow root, root structure, about eight to 10 square feet. And so uh, you can actually, well, eight, eight by eight or 10 by 10 um, uh, planting area. And so you can get a lot of trees in a pretty compact space. And this company does what's called cloning. And so they essentially uh, create a similar tree um, across an entire forest bed. Um, and it's all very similar to the mother tree, right? So they take one tree and clone it so they can kind of predict the properties of the tree and how it's going to grow, what the wood's going to be like when it's, when it's time to harvest and all that kind of thing. And so they just started um, utilizing analytics to a uh, uh, a really great degree the past couple of years. They've been collecting data forever, but they really haven't put, put it much to use until the last few years. And so what, one of the things they did was they, they wanted to solve some issues related to growth patterns um, that were coming up in recent years due to uh, higher temperatures and just changing climate conditions. And so given the fact that they had 14 years of data, they could go back and look at how growth patterns changed during very warm times or colder times or however the the weather was or the climate was compared to how it is right now when they're growing these trees. And they could identify growth patterns and understand how to impact the growth cycle and just the production of, of of their product. And they could really want to identify factors that would slow growth and interfere with development. So uh, they did that. And the other thing that they did is they looked on the industrial side as well. And based upon the quality of the actual wood product that came out of the ground, they could configure their digesters. And a digester is essentially the machine that takes a tree and turns it into pulp, which then is turned into paper or paper towels or, or whatever. And they did countless studies on the very specific characteristics of individual wood products to essentially understand how they should alter their digesters to harvest the most pulp possible. And so they changed the settings to produce the highest yield. And the results were pretty incredible. So after they started this little analytics process, well, this gargantuan and daunting analytics process, I should say, not not little at all, they changed their yield from 5.3 million tons of pulp capacity in one year. The next year was 7.2 million tons of pulp capacity. So just in one year, they just in, insanely increased their level. And they also, in doing that, were have been recognized uh, nationally in Brazil and really around the world for their sustainability practices as well. So it's a feel-good story as well. Um, and they own about 2.5 million acres of forest space. Um, only a portion of that though is, is utilized for, uh, planted forests. The rest is earmarked for conservation and preservation of these trees. Hmm. It's real interesting. That's really interesting, actually. All right. Next one I have is something, this is, this is a little bit of briefer, but this is something that I first saw 
actually when I was in business school, uh, this was a, a case study that we had to do. And it deals with Toyota and actually predating the Prius. It was just when they had their hybrid technology. And Toyota started making a lot of their standard cars, their Camry and I think the Corolla and other things like that, with the hybrid technology. And they, they had this great technology that was going to change the way people used gas. So they put it in their store, in their cars, they rolled it all out. And then what do you think happened? Nobody bought it. And they couldn't figure out why. They had done all of their market data. They'd figured out that there was interest in, in the technology. They figured out that the consumers were open to it. They knew that people wanted to uh, do things with an environmental impact or a positive environmental impact, I should say. So they're sitting there with all these cars that aren't selling and they can't figure out why. And so something that we talked about in, I think, episode three, maybe just about, about getting to insights and finding the right kind of nuggets and stuff. They stepped away from the, from the, uh, the program a little bit. They stepped away from their data. And instead of focusing so much on the actual car and the technology and people being interested in it, they actually focused more on the customers themselves and the underlying motivations for what would make their customers do things. And what they ultimately found is that when it came to just the general behaviors of people that wanted this car, they weren't so interested in the technology as they were in what people thought of them or potentially things being a status symbol. And so what they learned was that to appease the, this ultimate crowd or to, to cr basically use their technology in a car that would sell, they had to make the car look different enough that it would either become a status symbol or that it was so unique looking that everybody that saw it would essentially look and say, hey, there's a person driving a Prius. It's, they're either able to afford a more expensive car, which the Prius was, um, or they're really, really interested in doing good for the environment. But by putting that label on it or essentially having people look at the car uh, and make that determination, Toyota was able to design the Prius, which looked rapidly different than any other car. It looked like a spaceship when it first came out. Um, now, of course, we have, we have a lot of other cars that, that look similar. But at the time, the design of that Prius was so fundamentally different than anything else on the market, it allowed the people that bought that car to essentially be set apart. And that was a huge, huge personality trait in, in their audience. So when it comes back to how we put this to play in our own businesses, there are going to be lots of things that we either can't explain or we can't solve. And the first step, more often than not, is usually to step away and look at it differently. Because the more we look at data, the more we ultimately try to force our decisions. The more we force a decision, the worse that decision is usually going to be. So when you get stuck, step away, reframe the argument or reframe the experiment. And more often than not, you'll come to the right nugget. Yeah, it's so important to kind of look at that baseline and kind of determine how we should reframe the question a lot of times, right? Like if yeah. it's not working, adjust. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's just, you know, when we force stuff, we, we get screwed up. And I think we might have said it on the show, but, you know, when we get stuck. So let, let's say we're either looking for some insight or something or if we're writing something or whatever it is and we just can't do something. You know, the first thing I usually do is I usually shut my computer and go for a run or go do something like that. I just change my environment. And it's kind of funny the way it works in the background of my head. It's like the computer's still processing. And probably 99% of the time, by the time I get back, the problem has worked itself out for me. And, you know, when we're looking at data, it's kind of the same thing. You know, step away from it and, and either look at it differently or let the answer come to you because you don't need to force it. Have we talked about the book, uh, Hair Brain Tortoise Mind before? Have I talked to you about that? I think it's, you and I've talked about it. I don't know if we mentioned it on a show. Yeah, essentially the plot or the, the kind of the notion of the book is, 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 again, it's called Hair Brain Tortoise Mind. And it's essentially all about how uh, sometimes the best option when you're trying to go through a creative process or come up with a good idea or just let your mind work is to not even think about it. Just let it let it actually work itself out in the shadows of your mind. So oftentimes when, it, when I'm sitting around in a brainstorming session with a lot of people and everybody's having trouble, typically the best thing to do is like stop the brainstorming session. Let's all just walk away for a second, do something unrelated. And then two days later, all the answers show up. It's, it's just kind of very odd how that works. And that works for a yeah. lot of creative people as well. It, um, your mind is always working, whether you're conscious of it or not. And sometimes those ideas 
are uh, formulating and being fabricated um, while you're not even really cognizant of it. Yeah. You know, I think this kind of makes me think of this, this delicate balance we have between data and instinct. And I don't, I actually don't know what you think about this, but my belief is that kind of one without the other is is really sort of useless. You know, data is not going to have every answer tell us everything. And if it did, then the world wouldn't need us. Our computers would run complete, or our, excuse me, our companies would run completely on computers and autopilot. We wouldn't even need people to to run that if it was as simple as here's what the data says, go do it. Because there's there's an application of data that you know a lot of times produces adverse impact and does something completely different than what the data would would tell you to do. And um, Actually, I, I had a brief exchange a couple of weeks ago on, on Twitter with uh, Michael Barber, his friend, friend of the show, friend of ours going way back. And he posted a photo. I think he got a push notification from, um, I don't know if I can say the company's names, but I'll say Target anyway. And it said something effective like, congrats, you know, every, everything's great. You, you've got 76 cents worth of coupon credits for you. And it's like, is that 76 cents worth telling anybody about? And if you, if you just look at data, you know, the way these systems run and they run on autopilot, they say, Oh, this person has coupon credit. Let's message them and tell them about it. But it can't instinctively tell you that that 76 cents doesn't really matter to your customer. And that, that's why we have to be able to effectively balance these two things simultaneously if we want to make our data useful at all. Otherwise, we're going to end up in, in a pretty bad spot. Yeah, I think that actually leads nicely into the next one, which is actually from uh, Netflix. So I was a early subscriber to Netflix when it just came out. And I don't know if you remember, Chris, but it had like friend recommendations. So it was almost like um, your friend watched this, so you might want to check it out too. And I, I never see that anymore. I, I, I'm assuming they just got rid of it. Um, but you could tell that they're utilizing that information to help people um, get recommendations for movies to watch or shows to to entertain themselves with. So, you know, they had a ton of data about viewer habits uh, for their service. And right around the time, a few years back, that they changed their subscription model and actually increased prices and all their subscribers were flipping out. And um, people, you know, on Wall Street were saying, I don't know if this is a good idea for Netflix. They knew they had to do something with respect to really creating much more quality content on their own that they own. So they're going to create their own shows. And to do that, what they, what they started to do is start with some data and analyzed what uh, people really gravitated to and, and what ty- types of content really resonated with people on Netflix. And if there were certain uh, genres or actors or different types of shows or directors and so on, like they kind of mesh together. So what they found was there was a high um, population or a large population of people that loved movies by David Fincher. If you're not familiar with David Fincher, he is the guy that did movies like Seven and Zodiac, which is an outstanding movie, Fight Club and Gone Girl and movies like that, kind of like thriller type movies, kind of dark, right? Um, These people also loved political dramas. Okay. So different political drama movies, whether it be well, television shows or motion pictures or what have you. And the third element that kind of meshed all together with these people is they really enjoyed movies with Kevin Spacey. And so as Chris, you just noted a bit ago, data without instinct is kind of pointless. They utilize this data to combine and start a process of building the show House of Cards. So they hired David Fincher to direct it. Um, it's obviously a political drama starring Kevin Spacey, among among other really talented actors. But just because you have the data that those three things are going to work together doesn't make a great show. Um, now, House of Cards, in my opinion, did turn out to be a great show, but it still takes the talent of the individual producers and directors and actors and all the people behind the scenes, the writers, obviously, to create something really quality. And so the data is used here to inform the decision, but the talent is used to kind of bring something super quality to the audience. Well, and it's interesting. This isn't a crazy high level analysis that helped them arrive here. No, they it just probably, for probably took them five minutes. Yeah, it, it really did. It, it was, it's a very simple correlation 
and then they made the decision and you know there's a danger with this and and i'm i'm guessing netflix didn't do this but you know i, I see it a lot where you start looking at things and then you look at it another way and another way and you almost it's almost like you're looking for ways to undo the insight that you just found and to find ways to contradict it and so pretty soon you get down the road and you haven't made a decision. You haven't determined that we're going to develop content around these attributes that we just talked about. And because of that, you know, one of the greatest things that happened in Netflix's history, which is the development of House of Cards, never would have happened. When we talk about decision-making and fast decision-making, it's so important because that fast decision-making allows great things to happen. It, it, it really is that simple. Yep. Rip off the Band-Aid. Yeah. Just do it. Jump right in with both feet. So that's a perfect segue to somebody or, or an entity that didn't make a decision. Um, however, it worked out quite well for them in this case. So I believe, and I might be screwing up um, who this, this alt or who ultimately was responsible for this, but I believe it was UC Irvine that did a pretty big renovation of their campus a few years back. And one of the last things of the last touches that they had to put on th this really beautiful renovation they did was the sidewalks. Figure out how they were going to put the paths, how people were going to get from building to building on campus and, and all of that stuff. And for whatever reason, they couldn't agree how to do this. And somebody had the genius idea of saying, well, why don't we just hold off on putting the sidewalks in altogether? So instead, what they did is they waited maybe six months or a year. I don't know what the period of time was, but a pretty decent period of time. And they essentially took satellite imagery and figured out where are the people or the students on campus walking? Because from satellite imagery, you can see where paths are worn into the grass. So instead of putting sidewalks somewhere and essentially trying to force your people in a certain direction, they flipped it around, much like we talk about with testing. Said, all right, these people are walking here. That's what they like. We're going to put the sidewalks there. And as a result, they now have a campus that has sidewalks and methods of connecting building to building that are far more intuitive and far easier for people to use than if they had just gone ahead and done it themselves. And yeah, maybe they would have guessed right and gotten those sidewalks in the right place, but they didn't need to. And, and that's the beauty, at least for web metrics, as we talk about, is so many of these tough decisions you have to make, you don't have to make. If you just go a little bit hands off and observe it, these decisions are made for you and they're done very, very simply. Yeah, just make it easier for people. One way to think about it as well is like it's, um, it's not necessarily UC Irvine's campus, right? It's the student's campus. Sure. It's not necessarily your website. It's your customer's website. So the easier you can make it on whoever is actually use, using that product or that space, the, the better your results are going to be. Yeah. And you know, that, that mindset that you just described there, it's, it's so simple and it seems so basic as we talk about it, but it's not. People don't think that way. They think, I've got my site and I want people to do this on that. And you might want them to do it, but you ultimately have to figure out how they operate and cater around that. It's... It's not a chicken or the egg thing here. They, they they come first and you figure out what works for them and then you make your site play to that. It's not going to be the other way around because you are not going to change user behavior that substantially. Yeah, the focus should not be on control. It should be on helping. Yeah, exactly. That's a great way to say that, actually. Our last one is um, bringing it back to sports a little bit here. Um, Chris, you you ride a bike from now every now and again, right? Yeah, and I crash them. <laughs> no, too. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm really good at crashing. Bikes. But only the expensive ones. Yeah, there there are a few that I looked down and saw in pieces that really hurt my wallet a good bit. So this story is all about cycling and particularly a cycling team, uh, a, a track cycling team to be more specific. So if you're not familiar with track cycling, it's almost like indoor cycling. If you've ever seen the movie Breaking Away, which is a classic uh, that's, that's not indoor, but it was a track cycling where you're essentially doing laps around a, a track. Yeah. Around a velodrome. Uh, yep. Exactly. By the way, have you, have you, have you ever seen this live? No, I've never seen it. No. It is unbelievable to, to see live. The Just speed, on television. Yeah. Well, the speed and the crashes are remarkable, but actually over in Europe, track cycling is obviously in, in Europe, it's huge, but they have these events, um, called six days and it is it's like bigger than Coachella or one of those big music festivals here. These are six days of bike racing. and It is a giant party. There's DJs and music and beer and the whole thing in, the, in these great arenas and places like Ghent. And I think they actually do it in London as well. 
but it is incredible if you get a chance to go to that. It, it is definitely a bucket list item. Nice. E- even if you don't even like cycling, it's incredible to see. Sounds like a good time. So track cycling and Great Britain didn't really go together so well, right? They've never had any success as a country in any Olympic event related to, to cycling. Uh, before 2002, when a gentleman named Dave Brailsford was, was hired as coach, 76 years of Olympic activity, they won a single gold medal. They hadn't done anything. And uh, Mr. Brailsford was really obsessed with this idea of continuous improvement or Kaizen, right? So you, you may have heard of this before if you're listening to this Kaizen principle. It's actually two different words, Kai, which means change, and Zen, which means good. So essentially changing for the good or changing to improve, process improvement. People live by this idea. And he pl- he applied this this idea of Kaizen and a theory of marginal gains, or as they called it, the ministry of nudges. And what they did is they essentially tried to improve anything that could be improved. And they started with the obvious things like aerodynamics, like what kind of helmet should we wear? What kind of clothing should we wear to help us go faster and get around that track even quicker? They worked on preparation. So they broke things down in their preparation process, almost like a marathon runner would. So what are we going to be doing six months before the race, three months before the race, one month before the race, even hours before the race to prepare and and have our bodies in peak physical condition for a race. They also looked a lot at strategy, like how to get off the line, what to do when you're leading, what to do when you're you're in pursuit, uh, nutrition, water intake, um, motivation and mental health, which we could all use, let's be honest, a little improvement there. Uh, they they did a lot of things with sleep. So sleep, there's a lot of sleep studies, obviously, and people um, learning more about how sleep can impact um, not only our um, physical health, but just our mental preparedness and our productivity levels throughout the day. So they looked at the pillows, the literally, literally the pillows that they were sleeping on and their sleep posture, like everything that they could potentially improve and change, they changed. One thing that they did was interesting is they actually made everybody on the team or encouraged everybody on the team to wash their hands a certain way to just avoid infection. Uh, so you wouldn't get a cold, that kind of thing. Um, and the nice thing about this process is that, and I think this is a crucial step for, for the Great Britain team, um, is that everybody got on board. So there wasn't one naysayer that was saying, you know, I don't really believe in this stuff. I don't think it's going to work. Actually, it was the opposite. Every member of the team was really enthusiastic about it and started trying to identify little marginal gains, right? So like, you know, how could we improve our nutrition? What can we do with our sleep schedule? Um, What should we do if we're in this potential, this situation in a race and so on? Um, And so there was some mutual accountability as well. And so, as I noted, in the 76 years before uh, Dave Brailsford was hired, they won a single gold medal. In the 04 Olympics, the first Olympics after he was hired, they won two. So they doubled their entire results over the past, you know, 80 years in that time. In 08, there were 10 gold medals available. The team from Great Britain got seven. In 12, which was actually in London, they again got seven out of 10 gold medals for the, for the available events in track cycling. In 2016, they got six out of 10 golds. But in, if you look at their total medal count, it was two times as many as the next closest country. And so the key takeaway here is that if we make observations and make tiny little adjustments and then make some more observation and make some more tiny little adjustments and kind of get on that same track of plan, watch, react, alter, plan, watch, react, alter, we can really improve upon our, our process. Now, one warning sign for this is that uh, Dave Brailsford was also kind of the coach for a Tour de France team uh, from Great Britain. Yep, and they did not that. have the same amount of success right away that they saw with the track cycling team. And the reason that they kind of gave for that is that the race was different and thus the success factors were different. They were focused more on the little adjustments and not on the actual goals and the objectives and, and what it takes to be successful in that type of long, daunting marathon race. So as, as he put it, they were focused way too much on the peas and not enough on the steak. And so first, it's really important to focus on what it is that we're trying to achieve and what's going to help us accomplish our goals. 
and then build improvements around that strategy. You know, it's interesting. When Brailsford took over Team Sky, and, and you're talking about the Tour de France and the Giro d'Italia and a lot of these grand tours, these 21, 22-day races, uh, he took this mindset and he put in a lot of things that now in the, in the professional cycling world are commonplace. But a couple things he did. Um, one, you know, every team's got their big team bus that they drive around on from stage to stage and all that. Mm -hmm. He actually added a kitchen uh, car to that. So you've got your mechanics trucks, your bus, and you've also got a kitchen car. And so that way, the team chef essentially has their own kitchen stocked with their own ingredients and all of that so that you can control even the smallest or most minute details on their nutrition at every single stop on the road. Because historically with these races, there's a lot of variability in the ingredients or the type of kitchen you get from town to town to town because you're usually in remote mountain towns or wherever. So by controlling that variable, they found quite a bit of success. The other thing that he he did, and ultimately this got banned, but they tried to do this. They brought her along um, essentially a, a truck or a trailer or whatever it was that had very special bedding in it for their biggest stars or for their, their best racers. And the idea was that if they slept on the same bed every night, you know, you talked about pillow and sleep posture and all that, but if you slept on the same bed every night, then obviously you'd be on something that is, is optimal for your performance and give you that consistency to, to perform well. Now, for some reason, the, the UCI, the governing body for professional cycling, actually banned the idea of the sleep truck because they said it gave the team an unfair advantage when other teams were sleeping in, in hotels. And again, you know, you're in a lot of remote places. Sometimes the hotels are, are not terribly nice, but just those micro details paved the way for a lot of success for that team. And I think, at least the past, let's say, four out of the five past years, maybe. I might even be wrong about that. But um, a member of Team Sky, the team that Brailsford manages, has has won the tour. And now they're in a little bit of trouble for, for some potential doping infractions. But that team has been very consistent, and they attract a lot of people to that team because of their attention to detail. Yeah, I love that story. Just the, just the focus on marginal gains and just little tiny improvements make a big deal. And that's essentially for our analytics programs. That's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to make observations and tiny adjustments ultimately to lead to the best possible outcome. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a lot like, like bankers or hedge fund managers, things like that. They're, they're looking for that 10 X return. So you're looking for the very, very small thing that will pay off very, very big down the road. All right. Well, with that, I think that's been story time with uncle Chris and uncle Chris today. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I should, I should have said that in my best NPR voice too. So I apologize for, for skipping that. But that's all we got for this week. If you do have questions, comments, stories you'd like to share, we'd love to hear them. Shoot us a message at info at metricsagency.com or get in touch with us on Twitter or LinkedIn as we talked about. We're always happy to help. We love hearing from you. So until next time, I'm Chris Book. He's Chris Sietzema. We'll see you soon. Talk to you later.